Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would respond to patron emails, emails from patrons of the podcast. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. The first email here is from patron Brady. Brady writes, if you ever have time, I would love your thoughts on how realistic on how realistic it is for me to pursue a private practice right out of school or whether working for an agency is the better route. I have bills to pay and can't afford a super long period of low income, so I'm not excited about agency life. Plus, I am 41 already and I value the autonomy and freedom of private practice. I need to make at least 80,000 per year to make our budget work and it's my understanding that my that the that the pay in these community agencies is extremely low end of email from patron brady yeah um there's a number of things i can say about this i work with a lot of students and have for the past 20 plus years on this very topic basically after graduation from particularly master's programs but i guess doctoral programs as well um, depending on where you are in your career. But anyway, entry-level jobs. There are there tend to be a lot of jobs at, at community mental health agencies. And these agencies will often be funded primarily through government funds like Medicaid and, and whatnot. And the reimbursement for from these government medical insurances is usually quite low. Plus, you have the facility you have to pay for. You have your, you know, your your receptionists and and your upper administration, and everything. So these organizations have a lot of overhead, and so therefore the pay that eventually gets given to the clinician is just a percentage, a small percentage of what the actual fee is, which is again already kind of low. And so the the pay that these agencies can provide for these entry-level therapists can be, you know, low in comparison to what you can get paid in private practice. So, for instance, in Seattle, you could expect somewhere between thirty-five to 40000 a year at an entry-level job, uh, maybe more depending on the gig, maybe $50,000 if you get a, if you get a good, good gig. And for people who have a master's degree and especially for people who are a little older and might have more fixed expenses, you know, a mortgage, children, this kind of thing, or just a higher standard of living, frankly, um, 40,000 isn't, is, is pretty low. And, and so, um, so that's what people are faced with. Now, just a side note here, that's a crime in my opinion. Uh, Clinicians who are highly trained as therapists are, even master's level people, deserve a higher pay than that. And the solution to that is for the medical insurance to pay more, for the government medical insurance to pay a higher fee for that so that the more of that, those funds can actually go to the clinicians in these, in these community agencies. You know, the, the owners of community agencies, which are often nonprofits, but the, you know, these community agencies aren't funneling a bunch of money to their CEOs. It's, it's not like there's someone rolling in a bunch of money and there's all these, you know, poor workers at the bottom of the ladder. It's these, these agencies aren't making much money. So the solution is not to blame the agencies. The solution is to blame the government reimbursement system. And the, the people we can blame for that is our government officials and our taxpayers who vote in a particular way. We need to essentially raise taxes, and then the government needs to allocate those those raised taxes. It doesn't have to be raised that much. Probably would be unnoticeable to the you know everyday citizen in terms of what would need to be raised to you know increase the uh, reimbursement such that the clinicians could be paid, say, 60,000 a year, which, you know, for many people, they'd be like 60,000, that's a lot. But when you think about a master's degree, and perhaps how much debt someone is in, that's actually pretty low. Um, So 
Uh, now, you know, we go into politics about when you compare that to the worldwide income and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the point is, is that patron Brady is wondering about, um, you know, what he should do. Should I, should I work at an agency and earn a low amount or should I go immediately into private practice? He, he also is wondering how realistic it is. Um, well, it, it all depends is the thing, the, the answer that I'll say. Um, I'll tell you what I did, which is I immediately worked, I got hired by my internship site and I immediately started working at an agency. And I built my private practice on the side in that I saw private practice clients in the evening after I was done working at the agency. And I also saw my private practice on the weekends. So it was a bit of a grind during that time because I was working seven days a week. I was also teaching during this time. So that wasn't easy, but that's what I did. And then slowly over time, my private practice just built uh, up over time. And then I didn't need to work at the agency anymore. And that process took, I don't know, maybe three or four years ish, maybe, maybe three years. And I was hampered by the fact that I was still working at the agency 40 hours a week and, and couldn't really spend that much time in my private practice. So if I wasn't working at my private practice at all, I might've been able to build up my private practice much quicker, but I don't know. It's, it's hard to know. Plus often right after graduation, you have to wait a couple of years to become fully licensed and it's only fully licensed people that can actually use medical insurance. And a lot of clients in private practice want to use medical insurance. So, uh, so there's that, but I'm going to tell you from a lot of personal experience, uh, the following stuff. <laughs> it, if you want to, you know, the, if, if your ultimate goal is to go into private practice and you're uh, wanting to try, you know, right out of grad, right, at, right after graduation, then here's what you should consider that uh, there are two, there are three kinds of, of um, post grads that I've experienced. We have um, people at the bottom end who, when they start their private practice right after graduation, they never in their entire career develop a full private practice. So I might work with them. I might, so this is from a lot of anecdotal evidence is the thing. Uh, a lot of postgrads who start private practices. I see people who never get many clients. They, they might actively be trying to get clients for five years and have at any given time, a total of one or two clients, which is nothing, which is no way to earn a living, you know, cause that's like, I don't know, one or $200 a, a week or something, which is, you know, not a, not an income. And so there's those people I've, I've seen people like that. They graduate, they go directly into private practice and you know, they try to get clients, they're open, you know, they're, you know, they, they do a little bit of work to try to get clients, but they, but they just, their, their client load is just dismal. It's, and it's, and it's um, sad to see, honestly. Then there's this middle group of people, which is probably more like me, who it, you know, took me three or four years to uh, figure out a way that I didn't have to work at an agency. Um, I should say it as a side note that agencies aren't terrible to work at and uh, depending on your preference of work because there's plenty of people who work at agencies their entire career and they love it uh, the benefit to working at an agency is obviously you get a paycheck every week um, and you you know you're not in a sole proprietorship and you have a lot of protections around you in terms of legal protections you don't have to pay for the office you, you have colleagues around you get medical insurance paid for, you get benefits. Um, so there's a lot of benefits and you could earn more money as time progresses, as you sort of work up the ranks at an agency, it'll never come near what you could learn, what you could earn in private practice. But, but, uh, but people, people can make a good living. And I've actually known some people who in their later years will actually go back to work at an agency because they need medical insurance. And when you're in private practice, you have to pay for your own medical insurance. And for some people, when you get older, you, the medical insurance could be quite expensive. I don't, I don't know if anyway, but 
so there's various benefits to working at an agency that, um, so I'm not saying that everyone should never work in an agency. It's just, just, it's just preference. You know, I preferred not to work at an agency. Uh, I like being in my own business and, uh, being a private practice, but anyway, so there's this bottom group of people who for, there's something about them where they just never, ever get hardly any clients. Then there's this middle chunk of people who will slowly build a practice over the span of, you know, a few years. Then there's this upper crust people that I've experienced and they're, they're not very common, but these people within weeks after graduation, within weeks of hanging a shingle, within weeks of opening their private practice, even though they're not fully licensed, they will have a full-time private practice within weeks. It's crazy. I've seen people just two months after graduate, or you know, say three months after graduation, they have 20 clients, which is you know a viable full-time practice. Because if you're charging everyone a you know 100 bucks an hour which is sort of a a good rate to charge when you just graduated that's you know 2000 a week which is 8000 a month which is you know almost 100,000 a year or yeah almost 100,000 a year so and you're not even charging uh, the going rate which is more like one you know 120 to 150 or something so i've seen people do that and i've really tried to figure out what the differences between these three groups of people over the years. And here's what I can tell you. The difference is that the people who are highly successful in private practice are, are business people. These, these people know how to get a business going and they're not delusional about it. I, I've seen people in the lower rung who have a really hard time building their practice they think they're good at business and but they're not they they imagine that they they feel creative you know they feel like yeah i i can i can be good at business but they don't have the skills to start a business the things that i tell people is imagine you're you're starting a dry cleaning company or you're starting a restaurant how do you get customers to get come in the door you know um, or you're trying to start an online business selling earrings or something. For, for most people, they understand, well, that, you know, that's hard. It's hard to get customers. But for some reason, there are a number of therapists who think, well, I'm just going to hang a shingle and the clients are just going to come, right? I mean, that's just how it works. No, that is not how it works. You are a business and you have to attract customers. Now, it doesn't mean you have to like harangue people to come in to your office, but you have to you have to advertise, you have to spread the word, and you have to sell yourself. Uh, you have to have a, a good website. You have to do... Now, there's various different things that people do to build a business. But the people that I've seen who have been successful, they just have a mind for business. Maybe they were business people before. One, one supervisee who built a practice very quickly, she worked in website business. And she was like a consultant for, for websites. And so she had worked in marketing and websites and startups for many years. And so she just knew what it took. She, you know, she knew that you had to reach out to people. She knew that you had to really think about your brand. She knew that the content on your website really mattered. She knew that she, she needed to reach out to media and get herself on TV and get herself on the radio, get herself on podcasts, for instance. There, there were a lot of things that she did and her practice took off. Whereas the other people, it, they just, they don't do that. Even though as I'm talking with them, I, I'm telling them basically exactly word for word what I'm telling you guys right now. So, um, and there's, you know, two different reasons that I see why people don't engage in this business practice. One is, is that they don't know how, uh, well, maybe three reasons. Well, one is, is they don't know how the other is they don't want to, cause they, they just feel sleazy about it somehow. And the third reason is, is because, and I've seen this before, they're delusional about what it 
takes to get a business going. Delusional meaning not clinically, but just mistaken, highly mistaken about what it takes to build a business. You know, they, they just sort of think like, well, yeah, with minimal marketing, things will work out for me because things usually work out for them randomly because they're privileged or I, I don't know, whatever the reason is, they just sort of have this very unrealistic optimism based on no effort. And, uh, and I don't care as their supervisor because it's not a requirement for them to have a thriving business. That's mainly for them. I'm mainly just feeling bad for them. As their supervisor, I, you know, I'll supervise them if they have two clients or if they have 50 clients, it doesn't matter to me. But, uh, so this is just, you know, me sort of observing their, their business prowess. So patron Brady, if you think that you're in the upper crust, which is rare, then I say, go for it. But if you don't, then I would say, be much more cautious about this sort of thing. It, you say, you know, you need to get up to about 80 grand a year. You, that's a pretty safe income. It's pretty safe to say you can earn that income in private practice uh, when you're just starting out. Uh, it can go up from there, uh, depending. But, but even if you're in that middle, mediocre, business savvy zone, you could probably get 80 grand a year after, like I said, three or four years ish or something. And so there would be kind of a, a line, uh, on, you know, of income going up to that through the years. If, if that's, uh, um, acceptable, then go for it. But if it's not, then you're going to have to work at an agency, at least for the first couple of years to get some amount of income, uh, while you're building your inter while you're building your private practice. The other thing to think about that uh, I kind of mentioned earlier was licensure. In order to become licensed, you need to have a certain amount of clinical hours, postgrad. And if you work at an agency, you, you will definitely get those hours and more. Whereas in private practice, if things go normally, it's, it's going to take a while before you get all the hours you need, depending on the accreditation status of your, of your, education program and the laws in your state. Uh, so it's a, if you work in an agency, it's a very convenient way to get all the hours, the supervision hours, the clinical hours to actually get licensed at the end of two years. And that's what I did. So I worked at an agency, the end of the two years, became licensed, and that's when I started kind of phasing things out. Um, now, there are th things that I can tell people to do. For instance, there's a podcast that is solely, uh, it's been a while since I've listened to it, but it's called Practice of the Practice. And uh, I remember when I listened to it, I thought, oh, this would be great for recent grads as a podcast that has a lot of content on the website and within the podcast itself that is good advice to help people to build their business. The podcast from what I remember is solely focused on helping people understand how to get clients, essentially, how to get your search engine optimization going, how to have a website, how to market yourself. And um, so practice of the practice. So that's what I'll say about that patron Brady. Let me know if you appreciate that advice or not. All right, let's read another email. Okay, this this email is from someone who wished to remain anonymous. So this email's from an anonymous patron. Hi, Kirk. First, thank you for your podcast and the work that you do. I am a grad student finishing my master's in marriage and family therapy and art therapy, and your podcast has been enormously enriching academically, professionally, and personally. I have been struggling with a breakup for the past year and a half. I have been in therapy, which has helped me feel supported and given me some tools to help manage the pain. Without going into too much detail, I just feel so stuck in the pain and and lost uh, uh, in the, so stuck in the pain and the loss of my partner. What I keep coming back to is how much I miss him, how much I still love him, and how much it hurts to be without him. He left our deeply intense relationship with very little warning and moved out of state with another woman. I didn't see it coming. My therapist has suggested that he may be narcissistic, which in hindsight I would absolutely agree with. 
while this diagnosis may make me feel temporarily better about losing him, I have found little to help me get over the breakup. I find myself reading old messages and unable to delete them because they provide me with so much comfort. I am left with feelings of unworthiness and poor self-esteem. As a therapist, I can logically see my issues, but I have had so but I've but I've had such difficulty feeling as though I can heal from this. I do think I have fallen into a depression as I feel void of much enthusiasm or express sadness about anything. As a therapist, what approach has been effective for you in your work with your clients? I ask this both I ask this both both personally and professionally. End of email. Uh, yeah, patron Elizabeth also had a similar question that she emailed me today. I get, I get this question qu- quite a bit. I am writing a book about grief, as I always say, and I'll probably, till the day I die, I'll be saying I'm writing this stupid book. But one of the things that I'm writing about in this book, and one of the things that I'm realizing upon researching and just thinking and talking with other people is that we have this idea, not only in our culture, but also in our clinical world, that grief has a time limit. And whenever I lecture about this, I find that it takes me a long time to sort of beat this out of people's heads. This notion that that grief is something you feel for a time, and then it goes away. Well, here's a newsflash, people. It doesn't go away. And I know that that's a bummer, and that that sucks for this anonymous patron and for patron Elizabeth, but I'm here to tell you that uh, from personal experience, from clinical experience, certain grieve grieve certain grief issues certain losses never heal and i'm not saying that like as a pessimistic thing i'm just saying that as a realistic thing it's a human thing when you fall in love so anonymous patron falls in love is 100% dedicated to somebody and this isn't just a co- the, the other thing i think is that we often mistake our cognitive thoughts with our, with our emotional life. You know, the anonymous patron is like, I, I, I feel like I'm, I want to move on. You know, I feel like I, but I, I, I can't seem to move on. You know, I keep telling myself to move on, but I can't. The, the anonymous patron isn't saying that exactly, but I hear people saying that. And the thing is, is when you fall in love, it is a, all body experience an all brain experience it's not just your your conscious executive system your prefrontal cortex involved it involves that but it involves deep part of your brains that are designed to link up with a to associate another human being with love and attachment and security and um you know stability and just associate that person with everything, uh, uh, you know, in your life. We <clears throat> are designed that way. That's why our pets recognize us and like us better than strangers, hopefully. <laughs> um, you know, that's why we fall in love. That's the purpose, right? Uh, coupling facilitates the raising of children. We evolved likely to to do this. And so when we fall in love and, and when we get married or, you know, get into a committed relationship... Our, our inner brains are associating this other human being with a lot of things that we feel dependent upon. We depend on this person for self-esteem. We depend on this person to feel worthy. We depend on this person to be there for us and to support us and, uh, and vice versa. We love being there for them and we love supporting them and we love uh, being involved in their lives. And this is a deep brain experience. Neurons are literally being, creating connections that are associating this human being with all of these things that we were designed to do. And so when that person suddenly abandons you, when that person suddenly is just gone, whether it's through death, 
But even worse, they leave you. Because if they die, then your brain says, well, they didn't choose to leave me. They, the, the universe pulled this person away from me. But if they cheat on you and leave you, if they just abandon you, then they chose to leave you. So not only are they gone and you, you've, you've, you've lost them, but they didn't like you enough to stay with you. They didn't want to be with you. Now, I'm not telling the anonymous patron how to think, but that's the way we typically interpret that because it's logical to think that way. And there's a tremendous amount of pain involved in that, right? Now, so there's pain, but there's also a longing to get that person back in your life. Even though your prefrontal cortex, your executive uh, you know, system is saying, I don't like that person. He's narcissistic. He's a terrible human being. He left me. He's, he cheated on me or whatever. I don't want him back in my life. But deeper in your brain, which is most of your brain, and in your body, you still want that person back. And you're, because your neurons have rewired to a, associate that person with all of your attachment needs. And it takes a long time for your brain to not have those brain connections anymore, to associate all those love and attachment things with, with a new person or with just not them. We, again, as, we, as I said, likely evolved a brain mechanism that is that strongly drives us toward attachment figures. When we lose someone, you know, you just imagine you're on the African savanna 200,000 years ago, and somehow you get separated from your tribe. And your brain says, find your tribe, find your partner, find your children. And your brain will not stop telling you to do that until you find them. Well, that mechanism is at play when your spouse suddenly abandons you because that sort of abandonment probably was sort of rare back then <laughs> is, is my guess. But at the very least, it's, it's, a, it's an adaptive thing to seek out an attachment that you have lost, right? And so uh, even though you don't want to think about this person anymore, and even though you don't even think that person is worthy of what you are saying and, and, and uh, worthy of your love, your brain still wants that person back. Now, it doesn't mean you have to get that person back. It doesn't mean that, you know, that's a good idea for your life. But what it does mean is that you're going to have a constant uh, intrusive thought process that will... Uh, nag at you, you know, it's going to be this voice in your head, you know, text him. What, I wonder what he's up to. What, what's on his Facebook page? I wonder if he's happy. I wonder if his new uh, girlfriend is prettier than me or, you know, that those thoughts are just part of the game, part of life. And the idea that there's a therapeutic approach that can rid oneself of one's humanity is just misguided, but it's propagated by our culture and propagate that notion is propagated by our culture and propagated by clinical work. There's even definitions that, that uh, there's a lot of definitions around how long grief should last. Some say one year, some say two years. Well, I'm here to tell you there's no time limit on some grief. Uh, there's a chance that anonymous patron till the day you die, you will occasionally think about him and you will feel the pain of that loss. Again, I'm not saying that because I'm a bummer person. I'm saying that because in my personal experience, that's just how life works and that's okay. And feeling pain in that way is okay. It's painful and it sucks and, and none of us want that. And I wish you didn't feel that pain. And if I could take it away, then I would but I can't and you can't. And the, that's just how humans work and we just have to accept that. And sometimes when we accept that, then it reduces the pain. It doesn't take it away, but it, it reduces it. And 
Uh, also, tell pe- talk talk about it. You know, if if you can, uh, find supportive people and just say, "Well, I'm having a really bad week this week. I've thought about him a lot more. Maybe it's because a Christmas is coming up or something. I don't know, but I just, I just feel myself, you know." And then the person listens to you, and and maybe you find yourself reminiscing about the good times, and then maybe you find yourself getting angry about the abandonment, and then maybe you find yourself. Facebooking him and seeing what's going on. And then you find yourself drinking some wine because you're trying to cope with what you saw. And like, it's all just a process, you know, it's life. It's messy. Breakups are messy. Life is messy. Emotions are messy. And, and that's just how it is. And as a therapist, I tell you, I'll tell you what I, and as a friend, frankly, what I do is I just sit with people in that and I tell them it, it might not ever end. And I tell them about my own personal experiences with, with this sort of grief. And I say, I hate it too. I wish, I wish, I feel like the older you get, the more likely you'll acquire one of these, uh, you know, forever griefs. Maybe that's what I call in my, in my book, a forever grief. Um, yeah. So that's what I'll say about that. All right. Uh, before I go on to some more emails from patrons, let's just take a break. Okay, we're back from the break. If you haven't already, become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. When you become a patron, you get access to hundreds of premium episodes in which we do super deep dives that take hours and hours in each episode to talk about particular topics. So become a patron. If you become a pa- And also, if you become a patron, make sure that you upload a picture of yourself because I like to associate your face with your name, you know, <laughs> uh, especially if you email me a lot, it's, it's easier for me to remember who you are. If I have a face that I can put to that name. All right. Uh, this email is from patron Elizabeth. She says, hi, Kirk. I am reaching out in hopes that you will consider discussing people with disabilities on your podcast. As with many other oppressed groups, I feel this population experiences stigma from society. I was born with cerebral palsy, and even though it is minor, I still sense that many individuals don't know how to react to it. It has resulted in difficulties with finding employment and and even within the realm of dating. I feel in my heart that people fear what they don't understand. End of email. Yeah, this uh, email breaks my heart. It's a, it just breaks my heart to think that just because someone has a disability, they are shunned from society. They're made to feel unwelcome or, you know, imagine, you know, if you don't have a disability like this, imagine you walk out your door and every single person reacts weird to you. I I suppose this is like maybe like being black in white America or something. Or, I don't know, being uh, super short or super tall or something. I, the, the only time I can, I can relate to this is when I had really long hair in the 90s. And my hair was like obnoxiously long and it's very wavy and thick and uh, just obnoxious. <laughs> and so when I would walk around, I just remember I would just, I just noticed I would get these just very strange looks from people, particularly the further out from Seattle I was like, if I was in Everett or something, I would just get these, just these looks from people, you know, or people would be afraid of me or I don't know. I I, I just, I, I felt it. And I remember just thinking, Oh my God, like people are stupid. <laughs> I, it's just long hair people, you know, it's the nineties. A lot of people have long hair. Um, so now that's nothing compared to what patron Elizabeth is talking about. But I, I say that because if you can relate to this, um, uh, just try, because I think we can all do better as a society to not make people with disabilities feel ostracized. It's just, you know, it's just terrible. There are movements afoot that are trying to alleviate this. There are, you know, sitcoms on TV that are involving people with disabilities, which I think is just really, really good, particularly because 
you make fun of them. <laughs> like there's this uh, Jeff Jeffries, Jeff Jeffries, Jim Jeffries, Jim Jeffries, the, I think he's Australian, has a TV show that um, it's sort of funny. I mean, there's, it's got some funny moments, but it has a, um, someone who's disabled as a, one of the main, uh, there's three characters and one of them is disabled and, and they make fun of the disabled kid all the time. <laughs> he's not a kid. He's yeah, the actor's probably like 35 years old, but maybe even older than that. Cause he's been in movies for a long time. But anyway, um, it's the same when I see Asians in movies and they're the butt of the joke. It's, it's like, you know, you've really arrived as a group when uh, you can be the butt of the joke. Um, in a respectful way, you know what I mean? Uh, there was a period of time when if you ever had someone with a disability or if you ever had someone that was Asian in a movie or TV show, they were always these perfect characters because presumably the writers were too afraid of being labeled as racist to make fun of them, you know? Um, so, so we're seeing shifts for sure. But I would say on a daily basis, the... Uh, depending on the sort of circle. I mean, if if you work with people with disabilities and and you're or someone's in your family that has a disability and you're around people a lot, then I'm guessing you tend to be more relaxed and just normal around people with disabilities. But for the vast majority of people who just don't have contact with people with these sort of visible disabilities, my guess is, including myself, frankly, that there's a tremendous amount of awkwardness at the very least, if not just full blown marginalization and prejudice and, and, you know, reactions of horror and just all those kinds of things. And it, again, it just breaks my heart. It just, we're so stupid as human beings. <laughs> it's just so heartbreaking how stupid we are. You know, it, it's like, God, I, I, cause most people past a certain age understand that, people with disabilities are no different than them, but somehow we just can't beat that into our heads. I think part of the problem is that um, most people just don't have contact with these sorts of people. I uh, work um, at a camp once a year with this middle school, high school uh, group of kids. And we talk about bullying and depression and, chemical dependency and stuff. I talk about it on the podcast sometimes. But one of the things that I really liked about this school was that they had a autism spectrum kid who was in the school. And he was very noticeable in his awkwardness. But he wasn't so autistic that he was obviously autistic. He, he was, if you just started interacting with him, you would think, oh, he's just kind of different or kind of awkward. But Every once in a while, he would really exhibit these strange behaviors, uh, these, you know, but that are typical to autism spectrum, but strange to the other kids. And the way the school dealt with it was they would talk with all, all the kids, including the autism spectrum kid, about autism. And, and they would say, here's what it is, and here's what it means, and here's what and here are the things you should avoid, you know, like ostracizing them or provoking them or reacting badly to them or bullying them or, you know, it's just, it, here's how to interpret this sort of behavior. You know, don't take it personally and da, 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 you know, there's all this education and what ended up happening from what I could tell was all of these kids were totally fine and not awkward around this kid with autism spectrum. So, the, the, what this kid with autism spectrum was was giving as a gift to all these kids was experience with an autism spectrum person. And for the rest of their lives, they'll probably just be a lot more comfortable around people with autism spectrum. So maybe what should happen is every school should have a wide variety of people with disabilities sort of sprinkled throughout the you know student body so that at a young age, everyone can just, you know, get accustomed to that. I suppose that should also go for race, ethnicity, religion, and everything. Man, I'm just talking about a utopia right now, right? <laughs> and I'm sure there are some schools like this, you know. If you looked in some neighborhoods, I'm guessing there are schools that absolutely provide this. But there's also a lot of schools that absolutely do not provide this. 
So yeah, patron Elizabeth, um, breaks my heart that this happens to you, that when you're um, at work or even just finding a job that people are put off by something, you know, that doesn't mean anything and that uh, it's hard to date because of, of that. It just, it just breaks my heart, you know? Um, and I guess the thing that I will say about this is that by talking about it on this podcast, you know, maybe uh, a little bit can happen. At the very least, patron Elizabeth, you've affected me with this, with this email. And the next time I interact with someone with these sorts of disabilities, um, I'm, I feel like I'm going to be much better at handling my own reactions, you know, just trying to just be normal, you know, just, just be, just react to these, you know, to everyone with the same amount of non awkwardness or the same amount of awkwardness, maybe, you know, if I'm awkward with other people, I'll be awkward with people with disabilities. It's just, you know, just, just being normal, you know, just being a human being to other human beings and not being afraid of what we don't understand, you know, just having the self esteem enough to just, I don't know, just be human to other humans, you know? Huh, okay. Let's talk about another email. Thanks for writing in, Patron Elizabeth. That was uh, very helpful to me. And I hope the best for you. And let me know how things are going. And let me know if you need me to yell at anybody that you're working with or that you're dating. And, so, you know, I could tell them. Um, I don't know why I feel protective of you right now. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm mostly joking. But, you know, um, if you need me to yell at someone, I'll gladly do it. All right, this email is from patron Tyler. Patron Tyler writes, can you talk about projective identification some more? I was not aware of this happening before I heard your podcast. And now that I am aware of it, I, I really understand why I've had so many failed relationships, one being my marriage. I wanted to ask for another episode in regards to this giving more examples or explaining how it can affect relationships with a lover. This simple but very complex concept can be easily overlooked and it can destroy relationships because both partners fail to identify their wrongdoings and can never understand one another fully. And honestly, I think marriage therapists overlook this as well. End of email. Yeah, patron Tyler, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, marital therapists, couples therapists might not understand how this works and might overlook it. Also, some couples therapists might actually see it, but they don't know how to intervene with it. Um, so, because some couple relationships are extremely hard to turn around for the better. But, um, but yeah, it's it's projective identification is is a, a powerful concept that I find explains m most of human behavior, really, <laughs> at least most behavior that boggles us or most troubling behavior, you know, and the explanatory power of projective identification and especially mutual projective identification is, is quite strong. A brief overview is that when we're young, we internalize the relationships that we're in. So if my mother is loving me and feeding me and I am being fed and being felt as though I'm loved, then I internalize that relationship and that relationship becomes an internal representation. So this, I have an internal representation of that relationship within my personality in which I have one person being taken care of and I have another person taking care of the person. And then over time, if I have that rinsed and repeated over and over and over again, then that becomes a stable part of my personality. And that stable representation in my mind can provide a lot of different strengths and or um, experiences. For instance, the flavor of love that I experienced will, I'll tend to want to recreate later in life because the associated elements with that love I'll I'll want to recreate because I associate those things with that love. So as a crude example, if my mother wore a satin 
nightgown when she cuddled with me when I was an infant than I might really like satin sheets as an adult or something. You know, it's just a crude example. Or if my mother talked to me in baby talk, then I might want to talk baby talk to the people that I love, whether that be spouses or pets or children. Uh, that sort of thing. But it's much more complicated than that. It has to do with sensations and smells and vibes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we have a very, we all experience particular associations with each internal representation. This internal representation also provides me comfort. When I, as an adult, am upset and I need to be soothed, my internalized mother, my internalized nurturing mother can soothe me. It, so that I don't need to go to my mom to be soothed anymore. When I was two years old, I didn't have enough of that internal representation. So I needed to go to my mom to be soothed for everything. <laughs> if I was upset or if I was hot or cold or hungry or tired or whatever, I went to my mom. But as an adult now, if I'm hot or cold or tired or upset or hurt, I, I don't need to go to my mom. I have internal resources that can tell me everything's going to be okay I'm a good person, um, da, da 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 right? So that is because I've internalized that voice from both of my parents, frankly. On the other hand, there are what we might call negative relationship internalizations, which, and by the way, this is all my own object relation, the psychodynamic language. So take that uh, with a grain, take what I'm saying with that in mind. Um, now, there are negative representations that become internalized too. So if, if uh, someone's criticizing me and I'm made to feel criticized and I'm hurt and rejected, then I internalize that relationship. I, I internalized someone who's being rejected and criticized and I internalize someone who is criticizing and rejecting. And if that is repeated over and over again, then that becomes an element of my personality. And then that drives certain behaviors. Like I might have internal critical voices where I tell myself that I'm a fuck up or that I'm not good enough or that I'll never amount to anything or no one likes me or you know whatever those internal voices are. But the original voice didn't come from me. It came from someone else, but it was internalized. And these difficult uh, internalized representations become templates for relationships. And really it, all the internal representations, whether they're positive or negative, become templates for relationships. So in the same way that, that when, um, you know, I love someone, I will utilize the template or the representation that I internalized from the way my parents loved me when I was a young child. So that, so in a way, that's a that's a form of projective identification. I think Patron Linden actually asked me about this, and it can become quite esoteric and and kind of out there. But essentially, taken to its fullest extreme, I I contend that in my model anyway, that projective identification is not just a, a defense, but it's actually just the way in which we interact with other people. So so we. Utilize, so we tr we recreate both positive and negative um, internalized relationship representations. So, if when I internalized a loving mother as a as an older adult, I am now uh, externalizing that that relationship that I had with my mother in, in my other kinds of relationships. So, uh, and that can be all sorts of relationships. It can, it can, I can externalize it with a spouse. I can externalize it with a child. I can externalize it with a pet. I can externalize it back to my own mother. I can externalize it with you, the listeners. I can love you the way that my mom loved me. You know what I mean? My mom listens to the podcast. So hi mom. <laughs> um, so um, now, but what about negative internal representation? So again, let's go with the critical one. If, I'm made to feel criticized and someone else is criticizing me, then I will externalize that relationship as well. And through projective identification, which is a defense mechanism against this internal strife, this, this psychodynamic of, of uh, a, a conflictual dyad, a relationship that is within my psyche, 
So this, this fight is going on internally between two voices or two selves or two representations. One part of me is criticizing me and the other part of me is feeling criticized. Well, this is not a good place to be. It's, it's a, there's a high tension level from that of having everything internal. It feels very ambivalent. You feel very upset that it's happening inside of you. And this is all unconscious, by the way. So as a way of uh, alleviating that tension, uh, one way that we do it, there's many ways we can drink or we can displace or we can try to heal. But one of the ways we do it is we utilize projective identification by projecting one of those uh, selves or one of those internal representation sides to the outside. So for instance, again, I internalize a, a relationship in which one person is being criticized and the other person is criticizing. And incidentally, you can internalize a relationship that is outside of you. So if your mom is criticizing your dad, then you can internalize that too. It doesn't have to involve you, but it often does involve you because you notice things that involve you much more readily. Plus, most things happen to you. And so the repetition of that tends to make the representation much more significant in your psyche. But anyway, so if I have an internal negative representation regarding uh, someone criticizing and someone feeling criticized and rejected, then I have a choice. I can either make other people criticize me so that I project into other people the urge to criticize me and then they criticize me and then I get to feel criticized and somewhat martyred and superior because they're the jerk. But uh, I'm, pro I'm, uh, through projective identification, I'll socialize the other person to reject me and to criticize me. I might be a screw up. <laughs> I might perp I might un unconsciously make mistakes to provoke other people to criticize me. I might choose a lifestyle that provokes people to criticize me. So this makes this internal issue external. Or I can identify with the criticizer and the rejector, and I could proceed to socialize other people to make it easy for me to criticize them and to reject them. And then I proceed to criticize and reject them. And the socialized part, basically you just manipulate other people to agree with your original internalized representation. And in this way, we repeat all of our old relationships in our adult life. And the closer the person is to you, the more likely you're going to involve them in your projective identifications, which is the defense mechanism against an internal anxiety and internal tension, right? So the more mistreatment and the more problematic relationship uh, issues that you've internalized during your childhood, the more problematic your marriages are going to be, the more problematic your romantic relationships are going to be. Now, the mutual projective identification part happens when we think like a systemic person, a, a family systems person, in that it, it's not about the individual, it's about the system. So if we take a two-person system, both people have experienced negative things in their early life, and both people have internalized negative relationship representations, and both people need to utilize projective identification in order to survive that. And both people will socialize the other person to agree with one side of their negative internal representation. This actually, this process actually can facilitate you to fall in love with someone. So for instance, if I'm using the, uh, neg the criticism uh, dyad uh, example, as, a, as an adult, I might prefer people who are easily criticized. I might f tend to feel more love and attraction toward people who are uh, sort of noticeably incompetent or noticeably accident or mistake prone or something. And, th and then I feel love for them, but really what I'm feeling is a satisfaction that I can get my projective identification needs met. And then that person probably has a very similar internal representation, but they, for whatever reason, identify with the criticized, incompetent, martyred part and tend to want to project out side of themselves their the side of them that is the criticizer part that they've internalized. And so if you're understanding this right, God bless you. But the way that this goes is that both people, so you can have, so you can have, uh, you know, a man and woman who are married, 
both people have been criticized by one or more of their parents. Both of them have internalized these issues, but they identify with a different side of that. You know, one, the, the, the husband identifies with the criticizer and the wo- and the wife identifies with the criticizee while projecting the other side of that internal re- representation on the other person. And they feel love, but really what they feel is satisfaction of their projective identification needs being met, which can feel very good, honestly. It, it's, it's not just a thing that happens. It, it actually feels very pleasurable to externalize because it's like, it's like pulling a thorn out of your side. You know, It's like getting a sliver out of your finger. It's constantly nagging at your psyche. And then when you finally get rid of it, it feels so good. And that, that feeling can feel like love when in fact it's not. It's just projective identification playing out, which is why we tend to be attracted to the same sorts of people that piss us off in the same sorts of ways that seem to be reminiscent of the ways our parents pissed us off when we were young. That's why this whole thing happens because it's all connected, right? Um, so what ends up happening is using the criticize, uh, criticizee, criticizer into our representation both people fall in love with each other because they're getting their projective identification needs met and they proceed to socialize each other to agree with their, with their internal representation. And they become very black and white regarding who they are as a person. So the person who has in the system, who's decidedly the screw up becomes more and more of a screw up over time. And the criticizer becomes more and more of a criticizer over time. And then, if, so in the beginning, the projective identification uh, satisfaction felt good, but over time it becomes so exaggerated that it just blows up the relationship um, and probably should blow up the relationship. But, but some people stay in these relationships forever and you find that these people just fight and fight and fight. Meanwhile, all the while in this relationship, they're continuing to bolster this internal negative representation. You know, the, the wife who is identifying with the, the incompetent martyr is internalizing a new relationship that is very reminiscent of the relationship that she had with her parents in which she has a criticizing, rejecting other and a martyred, uh, you know, rejected, criticized self. And this just this just further entrenches that negative representation. And so when people are completely unaware of this process, they're just doomed to repeat the same relationships over and over and over again. Now, it's not super pessimistic. Even if you find yourself in the midst of a mutual projective identification, which honestly is universal. There's really no way out of it. It's just, again, how humans operate. But if you find yourself like listening to this or listening to other times I've talked about it and been like, oh my God, I've had 10 relationships and it's all been the same. And I'm, I'm in another one right now. The one you're in right now is not doomed necessarily. It might be doomed, (laughs) but it might not be. Once you become aware of this, you can start to change it. And you can actually heal from this within a relational therapy in which a therapist provides a corrective experience that doesn't play into your projective identification. Because the thing is, is when you uh, become involved with your therapist, you tend to involve them as well in your projective identifications, and you try to socialize them to agree with things. So for instance, for, uh, you know, the husband in this who internalized a critical other and is and tends to identify with the critical side of things might start socializing his therapist to become incompetent so he could criticize the therapist. But what the therapist avoids is to uh, avoids feeling powerless. The, the, the therapist avoids uh, distancing. The, the therapist avoids uh, being socialized to make a mistake, so to speak, or, or the, or the therapist just says, I make mistakes, no big deal. And just is more confident about it and less martyred and less, uh, you know, less worthless feeling about the mistakes. And this provides a corrective experience that the client can now internalize as something new that is healing to this, that diminishes that negative internal representation regarding criticized self and criticizing other. And in couples therapy, when you see this happening before you, you can affect change very quickly. 
And sometimes I'll just tell people what's happening. I'll just give them the kind of rundown about the theory of projective identification. But usually I just have a kind of shorthand way of, of explaining what's happening. And, and then once people are aware of it, they can kind of nip it in the bud. Um, and I can facilitate healing of their internal rep representations within the marriage itself. So the marriage can become a corrective experience that can diminish uh, negative internal representations. If if you are following this, I have to say I commend you because I barely am following myself at this point. <laughs> so, patron Tyler, let me know if if you followed that. Um, yeah, so there's projective identification. All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle on which I talk about your various different emails. Let's give out some patron swag. What do you say? I'm going to go back as far as I can to some of our oldest patrons here who have been with us since the beginning, way back two years ago or one and a half years ago. And I'm also looking on the patron page for people who have pictures of themselves because I like to... I like to associate, as I was saying earlier, a face with a name. And I have three people here. I have Karen, patron Karen. I'm going to send you some picture. Uh, I'm going to send you some uh, some stickers, swag in the mail, if you're interested. We have three different kinds of stickers. And patron Liz, looking at your mug there on Patreon. And patron Emily. So Emily, Liz... And Karen, I know Karen. Karen has emailed with me before. Uh, she be was one of our very, very first patrons, maybe like the sixth patron we ever had, something like that. So thank you, Karen, for being with us this whole time. You are super cool. And along with patron Liz and patron Emily, who have both been with us for about a year and a half. All right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. And let me know what you think about this episode. I've said a lot of random things. I'm a little insecure about what I was saying about the disability bit because that was just off the top, top of my head. I'm guessing I said some un-PC things. So patron Elizabeth, tell me, please, if I said anything stupid because God knows I do that sometimes. And, you know, I'm still a good person, right? <laughs> well take care of yourself because y'all deserve it